Uh, my name is Khalil. Now we're going to go ahead and move in to the journal club portion of our evening. And our first presenter for the journal club is Miss Lauren Merrill from the University of California, Berkeley. And she'll be presenting on a paper titled The Relationship Between Rugby Players' Tackle Training Attitudes and Behavior and Their Match Tackle Training Attitudes and Behavior. So Lauren, whenever you are ready, go ahead and share your screen. <clears throat> Here we go. Can you all see? Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present. Like Kira said, my name is Lauren Morrell and I'll be a senior at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, my article was the relationship between rugby players tackle training attitudes and behavior and their match tackle attitudes and behavior. Uh, this was an article published in 2015 by Sharif Hendricks, Steve Hollander, Nicholas Tam, James Brown, Michael Lambert, and their affiliations are listed below. So to sum it up before I go into the specifics of this article, these authors were trying to delineate the importance of tackle training uh, in injury prevention um, and the amount of time spent mm. of the injuries to prevent injuries. Um, in training to associate with the injuries in matches. So this study looked at how well essentially coaching in the training situation of, um, of play translated to the match play and um, injury. Specifically, this was done using the tackling modality of rugby in which it is a contest between opposing team players and it's very high risk. Um, a player's ability to uh, tolerate or contest this tackle is not only important for the safety, but also their success of the tackle and the success of their team and the game. Um, and being that on average, this paper um, provided information that a rugby player individually in a given match uh, engages in about 10 to 25 tackles, they thought this would be a really important and pivotal uh, action in the rugby world to see if it could translate between an, uh, a training position to a match position. So the method for this paper was an open and was a closed ended question questionnaire um, provided to students in South Africa who played traditional rug rugby at the Cape School Rugby Festival. It was given to 10 schools and about 220 rugby players. However, however, only nine chose to participate, um, giving about 164 completed questionnaires. These questionnaires were, um, like I mentioned, 16 questions and were giving on a five point Likert ordinal scale in which the players would rate these questions such as, um, uh, ability to stand up or keep on their feet or ability to avoid injury um, between two categories, which was A, which was the training and practicing situation and option B, which was the section four matches. So pretty intuitively, in my opinion, I, this transferred pretty directly from matches to play. Essentially, if the coach could teach the correct tackle um, it would translate into the player being more able and w uh, better at performing that tackle in the match performance um, realm. So the time spent emphasizing the proper techniques were correlated to the proper techniques, such as giving the ball or getting going for the ball only instead of going for an entire body tackle, which is deemed less safe than going for the ball only, which is a form of injury prevention. So essentially this led to, to results that were facilitated around the coaching sector. So in time spent um, practicing the correct coaching techniques and really emphasizing 
correct tackle techniques and tackle modalities to these players were translational in behavior and attitudes to their outcomes in the play. So as I mentioned, players had a positive uh, association. If they were able to understand that if I do this tackle, how I was taught in my uh, practice scenario, I would get better outcomes in my match outcome that would also make me a safer player. So I think this really lended itself to a foundation for the key importance of a training environment. Um, again, doing behavior such as what is practiced as the article mentioned or proper technique um, or staying on your feet were consistently associated with verbal and demonstrative practices of coaches teaching them the correct ways. So while this um, article didn't specifically stand at addressing specific sports, um, medicine, injury preventions outside of correct tackling, perhaps it was more focusing on like a correct tackle strategy versus a injury prevention strategy. This article in the conclusion was essentially saying that this is a very strong support that if we can get a group of coaches and academics and educated individuals to get a injury prevention curriculum going through these practices, that it would be possible for these athletes to take those attitudes and behaviors and implement them into a match setting. Here are my references. Um, thank you all for the presentation and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Lauren. If anyone has any questions, go ahead and feel free to ask them right now. And again, Dr. Lopez, if you have anything to add, feel free. Hello. Uh, great, great presentation, Lauren. Um, I was wondering if there were any correlation between like um, the different positions that players are in and like their rank within, the, like their leadership within the team, if that has any correlation with their attitudes towards practice and competition. So this article didn't specifically delineate between different position, different positions or stances and hierarchy within the team. But I think based on the positions, it would be moving forward, it would be really interesting to see which positions were more uh, um, accepting towards coaching direction or which positions were more concerned with injury prevention going into a match after being instructed in a training position, um, maybe based off of which positions are more likely for injuries and such. But that was not specifically mentioned in this article. Okay, thank you. I saw that that the confidence in their coach is also correlated with that. So yeah, it would be nice to see if they continue that study to divide into different positions or different um, ranks of the team, but thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I think uh, you did a great job, uh, Lauren, on the uh, anything about this paper. And I think um, maybe I've alluded to it before or not uh, with this group and that is it's always very hard to um, create a successful coaching curriculum, if that's the best way of, there are so many views or strong views on how to coach. Uh, and there are varying levels of success with that. So no one can really say one coaching approach is wrong versus the other. <clears throat> so the unique thing here is that to provide support for a potential curriculum is a great um, idea. The unique thing is uh, the acceptance and implementing it. Because I think um, the paper eludes me right now, but there's a paper where they evaluated from Scandinavia in soccer youth, um, the success of an injury prevention program is based upon acceptance by players, the team overall, um, coaching and administration. So it's almost a, 
a three-pronged approach when you're trying to create these successful injury prevention plans and incorporating uh, this understanding. And that's what this has become. This paper is like an understanding of what's going on with the tackling. It can be employed in some capacity with further analyses. And that's the importance of it. Even though they um, emphasize that this is, can be uh, a new area that can be replicated within training, the issue is, is that getting it implemented is really, really the difficulty. And I think that's something just to conclude. I mean, it's just, you can just imagine uh, trying to change a system maybe that's been working and it's difficult to try to go against that grain within the system. Excellent. Um, go ahead, Jasmine. I have kind of a quick question and or comment. Uh, I don't believe the paper asked or referenced it, but I'm curious to know if there was any mention of when within the season the questionnaires were completed, um, because I think that could have an influence on uh, the coaching styles, potentially. I think maybe the beginning of a the season, there might be more emphasis, more emphasis towards a safer tackle um, or a tackle for injury prevention, where on after a few matches, um, coaches may move towards language that talks more about rugby perform, I mean, tackle performance, um, and like whether you're wrapping or following through or making your tackles. Uh, but I don't think that was mentioned, but if mm. you did. Yeah, I, I didn't see in the questionnaire formation, it was just administered at a given week. And I think there were some possible faults with this paper as the questionnaires were returned all throughout the season. So I, and some lagged in response. So I don't think there was like a definite, uh, like period of when the, these players actually filled them out. But I think that would be interesting again to further the study. That was a great question. Okay, thank you again, Lauren, for the excellent presentation. I will go ahead and share my screen again quickly, and we'll move on to our second presentation for the Journal Club for tonight. And that's Miss Jasmine Strong from USC, University of Southern California. And she will be presenting on the impact of concussion and severe musculoskeletal injuries on the onset of mental health symptoms in male professional rugby players, a 12 month study. So Jasmine, whenever you are ready, go ahead and share your screen. Okay. I'm working to share it now. I apologize for the, actually, you know what? Sorry, let's just stop share for a second and move to slideshow. Okay, here we are. So um, Kira, thank you for the great introduction. My name is Jasmine. I am a master's student at the University of Southern California and I will be presenting um, a paper entitled The Impact of Concussion and Severe Musculoskeletal Injuries on the Onset of Mental Health Symptoms in Male Professional Rugby Players a 12 Month Study. Um, the study was done by a large conglomerate of authors, mostly focused out of the Netherlands. So and it was done and published in 2019. So for some background information, the game of rugby exposes players to high physical and mechanical loading, both during training and composition. As a result, it is deemed a very high risk sport um, and there's a lot of instances of and prevalence of injuries um, at multiple levels due to contact or non-contact. Um, recent literature has, sorry, Recent literature has identified uh, that their psychological factors can act as a predictor for injury in football players. And uh, in accordance, recent literature has also identified that this exists in rugby as well, where mental health symptoms are shown to be prevalent. Um, for some background, we were looking at professional rugby players within this study, or the investigators were looking at professional rugby players and time lost due to injury can have adverse effects on career um, growth, and thus there's suggestion 
that that could then adversely affect your mental a player's mental health. So as a hypothesis, the investigators presented that professional rugby players who sustain severe musculoskeletal injuries or concussions are more likely to develop mental health symptoms in the following 12 months. And for reference, a severe musculoskeletal injury was defined as an injury that led to time away from competing or training for 28 days or more, which is the same way we define it in our RISE report. So for the methods, this was an observational perspective cohort study. Um, the investigators asked the union league, the seven union league to participate. Um, so it was again, as I mentioned, focused on professional rugby players. A questionnaire was given and completed at three different time points. The first time point being a baseline, the second being a six month follow-up after the baseline and the third and final being a 12 month follow-up. During that, the questionnaire involved basically two main questions. One, asking whether a severe injury had occurred in the past six months, and another, if a concussion and how many concussions had occurred within the past six months. The questionnaire also included um, an additional five questionnaires, sorry for the continual use of the term, um, that involved, that were used to quantify mental health symptoms that um, had occurred and they focused on five mental health symptoms. First, a distress screener was given in order to quantify distress, a 12 month general health questionnaire for anxiety and depression, a patient reported outcomes measurement information system, also known as PROMISE for sleep disturbances, eating disorder screen for primary care for eating disorders, and a three item audit C, which was for adverse alcohol consumption. So for our results, first, the investigators chose to do a univariate and multivariate logistical regression analysis utilizing odds ratios. So they found a significant odds ratio for di distress and adverse alcohol use when assessing the concussions. And what they found was an odds ratio of two for adverse alcohol use, which, which correlates to 100% increase in the odds of developing adverse alcohol use when suffering a concussion and they found a 1.5 odds ratio for distress when looking at, when separating by number of concussions that occurred. And that would correlate to a 50% increase in the odds of developing distress when suffering a concussion. To follow up with the severe musculoskeletal injury odds ratio, they found an odds ratio of 1.5 for anxiety and depression when looking at this type of injury. And that correlates to a 50% increase in the odds of developing anxiety or depression when suffering a severe musculoskeletal injury. And also just for reference, odds ratios are considered significant if they're 95 percentile, if their 95 confidence interval, I apologize, um, doesn't include one and one would mean that there was no, there was no, um, no change. And that's what you see with, and these, uh, parentheses here. So for discussion, this paper emphasized the importance of mental health and taking preemptive approaches to reduce the onset of mental health symptoms in injured rugby players. So now, the, again, as I mentioned, this um, paper was published in 2019. I think in recent years, there has been this greater push to assess the psychological distress that may influence um, player performance. So on the onset of an injury, no longer need to, we no longer need to just focus on the physical state of a player and improving the physical state, but also potentially maintaining um, a good mental health status and treating the psychological state of the player as well. And that can influence who you have on a professional rugby coaching staff, um, if you're going to bring in psychologists and so on and so forth. Um, to continue the future direction that was proposed within this paper was looking at the relationship between the numbers of number of concussions and the mental health and onset of mental health symptoms. And this is really synonymous to what Dr. Delalo just mentioned about how once you have one concussion, um, your likelihood for further concussions increases. So there is likely that with a larger amount or an increase in amount of concussions, um, your time off increases and so forth that your mental health status may decline. Um, and for limitations, I felt 
that were reported within this paper and one that wasn't. Um, a limitation that investor investigators stated was that the questionnaires were self-reported, which always introduces a source of bias into, um, into your study um, where players may extrapolate or um, under-report basically their mental health status or even their injury rates. Um, also, the sample size or the players asked came from a variety of countries, which is a strength in some respects to the study, but also can offer uh, offer a area of variation or introduce variation within the study as the connotations as the connotation of mental health status and mental like and mental health symptoms can vary between different types vary between different countries and that could become a confounding factor within um, this study and these are my references and thank you for allowing me to speak thank you for that presentation jasmine it was great does anyone have any questions or comments to add i actually have a question uh that was a good presentation jasmine uh, i was just wondering uh, how would the how do you think the results would be different if they because this study only focused on males so if they included females in this study because I feel like males are less likely to open up about like mental health symptoms or more less than less likely than women so how how do you think I mean that would be interesting to see but that is like definitely a thought is like how the connotation of mental health or like you know, stereotypes that exist within society, um, how that influences reporting. Um, I can't speak on it because I won't know. And I can tell you that like women rugby players too are like a totally, like can be considered a totally separate, um, are likely to not want to report their injuries either or maybe not talk about their mental health status um, as well. But it is nice that this was a recent study, 2019. So even the willingness, I believe they had 370 about players fill it out. So even the willingness to talk about um, mental health is a positive or a plus. Um, I have a question. Uh, this is also for Dr. Lopez as well. So I know mental health isn't considered sir, like perhaps an injury, but are in sports medicine are we working towards the prevention of like mental health issues related to those injuries as well or is that something completely separate that is addressed in a more um, psychological side of research well uniquely um when you look at sports injury prevention it's cascade and many pyramids or um, um I guess, wheels that make up the different parts of the pie. You have team psychologists as an important piece of the pie, just as much as sports medicine doctors or, um, you know, coaches. Their inputs or injury prevention in itself should be taking from everyone their input and insight. Um, I think not only do um, players encounter the variations of burnout through the season, which takes a toll mentally on them and therefore could possibly reflect in their uh, performance on the field. Um, and again, um, it's very uh, difficult to try to quantitate these things, but um, I think that we've been preparing for understanding what's going on um, during season, as well as players who have concluded their overall play. Um, I think a unique aspect is, is that we do have something prepared already to try to look at that in more detail. So that's not too far. Um, that may be a study if you're interested in uh, and running with it. We already have, I think, I do think everything is already prepared for it. So like I said, it's an important aspect to address 
and players do feel that cyclical um, problem preseason, postseason, within season, and even with travel, you know, it does take a toll on the team and the player. Thank you, Dr. Lip. Okay, great questions, everyone. And thank you again, Jasmine, for that presentation. I will share my screen one last time and we will go ahead and begin with the final the final presentation for our journal club for this evening. So our next presenter is Eric John. He is from Stony Brook University and he will be presenting on How Much Rugby is Too Much, a seven season prospective cohort study of match exposure and injury risk in, in professional rugby union players. So Eric, whenever you are ready, you can go ahead and share your screen. Thank you for that great introduction. Okay, can everyone see? Yes. We yep. can. Okay. So my name is Eric John, and the article that I will be presenting today is How Much Rugby is Too Much? A seven season perspective cohort study of match exposure and injury risk in professional rugby union players. Can I go full screen? All right. All right. So there has been many studies that have been done on the nature and rates of injuries in professional rugby. And it has been found that uh, professional rugby has a high rate of injury and resulting absence from match play and training compared to other team sports. However, many other studies uh, have not taken into consideration the effect of long-term and short-term match exposure on uh, injury risk in this setting. So that's why this study uh, aims to look at the relationship between long-term and short-term match exposure and injury risk and assess that quantitatively. So this was a seven season uh, study that was done from 2006 to 2013 with 12 teams, but 15 total teams due to promotions and uh, relegations between divisions. It was a total of 1,253 professional players that participated in this study. They defined long-term match exposure as the number of matches that a player participated in that was greater than 20 minutes throughout the preceding 12 month period. And this allowed for meaningful substitutions to be included into the data set. They define short-term match exposure as the full game equivalents, which basically means uh, the total match exposure over in a, the following 30 days divided by 80. They used a statistical model called the nested frailty model to calculate hazard ratios of injury risk with 90% confidence intervals for various risk factors such as uh, repeated injury events which is important because a lot of other studies did not include uh, repeated injury events uh, or didn't take that into account when make, uh, using their, in their data analysis. So on the left side, you can see all the statistics such as the number of injuries in match and training, the average injury rate per thousand hours and the average exposure rate uh, in the 12 and one month period. So on the first figure, it examines the long-term match exposure uh, relationship with hazard ratio, uh, with hazard ratio being on the y-axis, 12 month exposure being on the x-axis. And so basically anything below 0.9 would be deemed beneficial and anything above 1.1 would be, uh, be deemed harmful. So as you can see, uh, players who participated in less than 15 or greater than 35 matches uh, were at an increased risk of injury over the long, uh, the 12 month period. And on the right sided figure, you, uh, they did the same relationship, but instead they looked at one month max exposure. And this actually showed a positive and linear uh, association, suggesting that the more games you play in a short amount of period, the more like uh, 
the more you are at uh, for risk, injury risk. So this first table uh, looks at all the variables that they um, used in their statistical model. And almost all of them besides uh, history of previous injuries um, were insignificant because uh, if you had a history of uh, previous injuries, the hazard ratio was 1.28, which is, was above 1.1. So they uh, deemed it significant and likely harmful. They also looked at the relationship between one month max exposure and 12 month max exposure. And they saw that players who played more than 28 matches uh, would have a likely benefit compared to the players who played less than 12 matches, which was used as the control group in that case. So based on the data, the authors believe that high match exposure, short-term and long-term, can uh, influence your risk for injury. And that's because rugby is a intense uh, physical uh, sport that can be very physiologically and psychologically taxing. And if you don't have proper rest, uh, it can lead up to built up fatigue and it can lead to your body being a more vulnerable state. And if you are injured, you are even uh, more likely, um, you are more likely at risk for re-injury because when you're injured, you don't have uh, your coordination, your movements, your reflexes, reflexes can all be impaired. So they suggested as solutions to uh, season the schedule a little better in that you have more in-season breaks or you have longer off-season breaks. And for those who are injured, they suggested to have like modified rehabilitation and recovery strategies to prevent further re-injury. This study f did not take into account uh, intensity factor, meaning um, they weren't able to like assess how, let's say how hard players were hitting. So they suggested to quantify this by um, counting the number of collisions that a player would go through in a match. They also did not take into account uh, training loads, like individual training loads. And this would, if they took this into account uh, for future studies, uh, if it could provide a better, if you looked at the relationship between pair, player workloads and injury risk, it could provide a better overall picture. And yeah. That's the end of my study. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you, Eric John, for that presentation. Again, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask any questions or comments right now. Um, I just have a question for the group or anybody's, um, anybody have an, any idea about why you might think earlier on, like less than 13 games there's still like a high risk of injury. Like what, well, what, 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 what might that be? Like in why? the study, yeah. They actually um, no, uh, reference this in the study saying that if you like, if you're not active, let's say like you go in to a game and you don't stretch, like you're not as active, you could, you're at, it makes sense that you're more likely to get injured. That's why if you're like, if you don't play as much games, you're not, I don't know. Oh, is it time for the low frequency of activity? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, to comment on that as well, I know that that's a big concern right now with not just rugby, but all sports because there hasn't been competition due to the COVID pandemic. And there's concerns that athletes haven't been playing at the same level for almost a year now. And that when they return to play at their normal level of intensity and level of activity, it'll introduce a risk for injury. That's definitely something interesting to look at in the future in terms of injury rates in rugby and other sports. So that might be a reason, as Eric John said, that early games in the season might have a higher risk for injury. 
Are there any other questions? Go ahead. Oh, I, just to like speak on this and anyone correct me if I'm wrong, but um, this like even works on like a tendon ligamental muscle um, level is where like there's a kind of a spectrum and like if you underuse the muscle tendon ling ligament you like introduce opportunity for injury and then if you overuse it um, the same type of situation um, yeah but it's also really cool like they talked about like not knowing how to quantify intensity or um, player load and or training load and there's like cool tech out there now that is like trying to like quantify this type of stuff. So like out of Australia, even there's like these catapult units that like you could wear and they'll like give you um, like wear during players will wear during sessions and they'll give you like a player load for that session. And the goal is to try to match um, it's kind of what sports scientists do is like try to match player loads and create schedules so that like you're prepared. You're like working your way up to the magnitude of the game and you're prepared for a game. That is very cool. I have not read very much about those tools, but the new technology is always very impressive that they come up with. Are there any other questions before we conclude? Okay, if not, then I'd like to thank everybody who is on our conference call for joining us tonight.